Numene Padre Sepedi, e et Spedit Sancti. Amen. Uh, two saints today from the city of Alexandria, and that is in Egypt. Uh, we have Saint Apollonia, a uh, virgin and martyr from the year 250. Uh, and then we have uh, Saint Cyril of Alexandria, uh, father and doctor of the church in the 5th century, uh, about the year 400 to 440. Uh, so first, our virgin martyr, uh, she was killed during the time of the Emperor Decius, um, again, the year, around the year 250. And, you know, persecutions are raging in the empire, and this is anti-Catholic sentiment, right? It's not just the edicts of the emperor, it's not just legal proceedings against the, 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 these Catholics, but it's, it's the, the mobs, right? Just people blaming the Catholics, um, you know, mobs of people getting together and deciding, let's take matters into our own hands. And so that is how Apollonia was martyred. Uh, there was some um, kind of pagan festival uh, taking place and uh, a priest pr prophesied um, um, or predicted some dire calamity because of the Christians. And so the crowd uh, becomes wild and violent, uh, looting, killing, you know, burning down houses. And Apollonia herself was um, apprehended. And she was a... Um, a kind of a higher profile figure. She was a, a, what is known as the, um, the deaconess in the early church. That doesn't mean she was a deacon as we understand it now. Uh, that meant that she was uh, one of the females who helped um, other females during their baptism. Because, it, you know, in the old days, it was a very, like, comprehensive thing. Like, you got into it with your whole body. So uh, the men and women would be separated for baptism and they would um, strip down to their birthday suit, right? And they would walk through a pool of water, symbolizing death with Christ and rising again, the flood, the Red Sea, and so on. They would come out on the other side, and then they would be clothed in a white garment. So um, if you've got a bunch of men and women doing that, you, you, you need proper deacons and deaconesses uh, supervising that. So that's what she did. That's what female deaconesses were for in the ancient church. Uh, so she was a high-profile uh, deaconess of this kind, and she was seized by the mob, tortured, and among them had her teeth broken uh, by blows or rocks or whatever the case may be. Even some have them uh, pulling out her teeth with pincers. And a great uh, pyre was lit and uh, burning, and she was uh, told, uh, um, you know, apostatize, yield your faith, um, honor the gods, or you'll be burned. And so in a display of courage and faith, uh, she upbraids them uh, for their lack of faith and to show her fearlessness uh, doesn't wait to be thrown into the fire, but jumps into it herself. Not suicide, uh, but a mark of, um, of bravery. Uh, similar, there was um, some other women, I think, uh, uh, associated with her in the same event, and they threw themselves into the river uh, to avoid either um, to preserve their chastity and to again show their faith in Christ. So thus the virgin uh, martyr Apollonia, uh, the year 250 from the city of Alexandria. So uh, now St. Cyril of Alexandria, about 150 years later, um, would grow up. He was the, the nephew of Theophilus, the bishop uh, of, of Alexandria. And Alexandria um, is kind of a rough city. Like you kind of got an idea from what happened with, uh, with Apollonia. Not, not a whole lot had changed by the time Seal of Alexandria had, uh, um, uh, had come. Uh, fewer pagans, right? Uh, uh, more, more Catholics, but there were also there were Arian heretics, Nestorians, Novatians. Uh, the city was not united. There was a large population of Jews as well. Um, and the bishop at that time, the bishop had come to exercise quite a bit of temporal power. Uh, almost, uh, you know, much more than even our own civil governor, well, is supposed to have these days. Uh, but the bishop exercised a lot of uh, both theological and civil temporal power. And Cyril of Alexandria was the nephew of this bishop. And, um, and he'd grown up, right? Cyril had grown up in this, this uh, tough city. Um, he'd heard stories of, of St. Uh, Apollonia from his own city who had given her life, who had been uh, killed by mobs and so on. So, he, you know, this is, this is his background. Uh, he would go with, with his uncle to um, the, count, the Synod of the Oak, in which uh, St. John Chrysostom was deposed and exiled. So he wasn't always on the right side of things. He would, he would eventually support um, Chrysostom's return, uh, but you know, it wasn't easy to know what's, what's the truth and what's a heresy. 
Uh, he would be chosen bishop at a young age. Uh, Cyril was. He was chosen when he was like in his 30s, 32, 34. He was chosen to succeed his uncle. And um, he had a choleric temperament. Uh, he was very zealous for the truth, uh, zealous for um, orthodoxy. And so one of the first things he did when he became bishop was to close all of the Novation uh, uh, heretics' churches, seize their goods, and um, essentially, um, was it like a, a seizure of power? Uh, it didn't, that wasn't the most, uh, we say, ecumenical manner of acting. I mean, it was effective, it worked, uh, but it, it stirred up more trouble, right? People were very upset by that. Um, he did a similar thing with the Jews in the city. Uh, there was a large community of Jews that had been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, and they were a very powerful faction. And at one point, um, you know, tensions were high, and there had been a, a mob, there had been a riot, um, a number of, of Christians, uh, Catholics had been um, uh, massacred. And, you know, I mean, you can imagine. Imagine his background, imagine what he's growing up with. Um, so he says, fine, all Jews are expelled from the city. So he rounds them up, expels them from the city, and he seizes their goods as well. Uh, again, not the most, uh, not the kindest or most sensitive manner of acting. Uh, we'll talk about that later at the end, but this is, this is the, um, the milieu, right? This is the environment in which he's uh, operating. Uh, but, but this is not what he's most known for, right? Those are, those are the things that he's doing. But he has, he's a, uh, one of the church fathers, he's a doctor of the church, and he's given the title of, what is it, a seal of the fathers and pillar of the faith. Uh, so, you know, despite this other kind of like dramatic things going on in the background, he was uh, one of the major um, writers and authors uh, upholding the doctrine of Mary, mother of God. Uh, so he was very clear about that. There was absolutely no, no wavering, no swerving, and a very clear exposition that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the mother of uh, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Uh, Jesus Christ, the man, uh, is a true man. He has a body, he has a soul, he has everything ap appropriate to his human nature, um, and that person is God. And God has a divine nature, everything appropriate as God. Uh, this would, he would define this as the hypostatic union, um, a term we should be familiar with. Uh, this would be defined at the Council of Ephesus in 431 and the Council of Chalcedon in 451. Uh, so this is, this is his contribution, Cyril of Alexandria. That is primarily uh, what he is known for and his, his place in the church as one of the church fathers is passing on uh, those, um, that understanding of Christ from the apostles themselves who understood it because they were with Christ and they were with the Blessed Virgin Mother. Um, and this, this uh, doctrine, it's called, let's see, uh, Mary Mother of God, uh, it's called um, uh, Dei Genetrix is what we call that in Latin, or Theotokos in Greek, Theotokos the God-bearer. This is what he's, he's um, uh, famous for. Against Nestorian, right? Nestorian was a bishop of Constantinople proposing this theory that uh, 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 the Virgin Mother was not Mother of God as well. So that's, that's the whole um, uh, 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 point of dogma and doctrine that he is the champion of, uh, to champion the truth. Um, but, you know, again, he, he kind of did it in a choleric manner. Um, he had a bit of a strong arm. And this would get him into trouble in that um, at the, uh, he would depose Nestorius, the bishop of Constantinople, in a rather rough manner. Uh, he was deposed and he was exiled. And to his credit, right, to, to the credit of Nestorius, the heretic, he, he bitterly opposed this. Uh, he wrote against it. He complained, but he went. He was exiled to a monastery, and he went there, and he lived at that monastery, and he was obedient. So that, that is the proof of, um, I would say, the faith is not necessarily whether you're on the right or wrong point of doctrine, especially if it hasn't been defined yet. It ha wasn't defined at this time. This is, it was being defined. But are you obedient to uh, lawful orders from your superiors? Even if they're wrong, if their order is lawful, it does need to be followed. And so Nestorius, uh, despite being an arch heretic, was also a good example of obedience. So it, you know, you have this this kind of both sides. No, you know, no, very few people are completely evil, right? And most often they're they're proud, they're stubborn, they're wrong, they're selfish, uh, but they they do want to be doing the right thing, right? And so we see that with uh, with Nestorius. Uh, same thing with Cyril. He's, he's criticized for his behavior, uh, but it was, it was from a good um, motive, right? Zeal for the truth, zeal for Christ and his church. Um, but he would, uh, the thing that kind of got him into hot water was at Chalcedon. Uh, 
uh, 451, there was a, dele uh, a delegation of bishops coming, supporters of Nestorius, and they asked him to wait. Hold, hold up on the council, we're almost there, we're gonna be arriving, and he uh, started ahead of time anyways, and he strong-armed some uh, other doctrines through that he, was, that, he, that he wanted. So the other bishops showed up, and they held a council of their own, and they deposed St. Cyril. They declared him a heretic and exiled him, and he exiled them, and then the emperor exiled everybody and said, just, you know, get out of you, you're, you're done. So eventually he would be restored, the pope would intervene, um, but it was, that's kind of an example that, you know, zeal has to be tempered. You, 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 you know, you can't be, well, I'm right and I know I'm right. Okay, even if you know 100% that you are correct, that is not all you have to consider. And this is a big problem uh, with, with, with zeal, right? Zeal wants to take a part of the truth and make it all of the truth, right? This part that I see, which is maybe 50% of the truth, but I see it as 99% and everybody else is wrong. That will always get you into trouble. Um, and, and, and that was the problem with St. Cyril. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, when I read about these saints, I, I go to other, you know, all these different websites and encyclopedias and so on. And I, I can generally tell, I'm like, oh, Franciscan media, I wonder what they're gonna have to say about this. Uh, not, not too, uh, I, I kind of know what to expect, and sure enough, it's, um, I'm going to read you what, what, what is said about St. Cyril uh, from Franciscan Media. No, di no disrespect, it's a good site, but um, uh, let's see. Saints are not born with halos around their heads. Cyril, recognized as a great teacher of the church, uh, began his career as archbishop with impulsive, often violent actions. He pillaged and closed the churches of the Novatian heretics, participated in the deposing of St. John Chrysostom and confiscated Jewish property, expelling the Jews from Alexandria in retaliation for their attacks on Christians. Lives of the saints are valuable not only for the virtue they reveal, but also for the less admirable qualities that also appear. Even saints must grow out of immaturity, narrowness, and selfishness. It is because they and we do grow that we truly are saints, persons who live the life of God. Okay, I mean, not so bad. Um, what I see in there, though, is a misunderstanding of the problems of St. Cyril. Immaturity, narrowness, and selfishness, uh, you don't see that in his life, right? That's not what you see. You see bitter zeal. You see um, a kind of a stubbornness. You see a, um, a, a one-sided, perhaps, approach which considers yes to truth. Uh, maybe that would be considered narrow. Uh, but what I hear about this is I hear the modern world uh, steeped in their own prejudices. Uh, the modern world and the modern church is it's difficult to, to distinguish virtues from values. The modern world values sensitivity, tolerance, and inclusivity, right? And those are not virtues. Uh, it is incredibly important to be able to know what is a virtue and what is a value. Uh, values are something that are important to me. Virtues are something that are good. Virtues, are, we could say, are something important to God. Uh, I can value what is not good. I can value what is not a virtue, but virtues are always going to be good. Uh, so um, St. Cyril of Alexandria would be a product of his time. He was from a rough city, a rough background. People were rioting, people were looting, people were killing each other. And uh, who knows, how, if, if we were transported back then, how would we behave? How would he, we behave if over at St. Mary's, right over here in Littleton, um, there was, I don't know, a Jewish mob that came and they killed 15 people, right? And this is not something that was, was out of the ordinary, right? You, your tensions would be high. Yeah, we would not be so happy about that. And they were like, yeah, we don't like you and we're going to keep doing this. What are we going to do? Roll over and say, oh, you know, we should be tolerant. We should send them letters of disapproval. That's not going to work, right? They're throwing rocks and, burn, and burning things down. So, you know, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, you have to be able to look and say, what, what is the environment in which I grew up, right? And I would tell you that right now in the modern church, we've grown up in an environment that is shaped by corrupt churchmen. Look at the hierarchy. Look at what we're seeing come out, right? Two years ago, we had the summer of shame. You have, uh, you know, accusations that there's rampant homosexuality in seminaries. What do you think seminarians are going to be formed at if all their professors are, are shaped by effeminacy, homosexuality, weakness, corruption, and so on? It's going to have an effect. So what you have to do is look at what is the environment in which I grew up and what are my likely prejudices. Our culture today is weak. It is selfish. It is immature. Um, it, it, again, it, it values. It takes values instead of virtues. We can't but help be shaped by that. 
So when we look at the past and we see a, a, a saints of the past, we're going to see them in the, in the, through the lens of our own uh, um, uh, background, right? Our own upbringing. So we have to ask ourselves, wait a minute, I need to know what is virtue, pure and simple? What is prudence, justice, temperance, fortitude, uh, charity, firmness, boldness, courage, maturity? What are those things first? How do those apply? How does my life measure up to them? Okay, I've got to face my own weaknesses. Now that I'm more objective, then I can, I, I can have the ability to look at other saints and say, okay, where was their problem? Right? Instead of accusing uh, St. Cyril, oh, he was too harsh, he was too violent, he was too this. Okay, maybe he wasn't. Maybe that was the right thing to do, to expel the Jews or the Novatians. Maybe he didn't do it exactly the right way. Maybe he didn't do it with virtue, but we can't say that was wrong because it was insensitive, not tolerant, not inclusive. I could go on, but you get the point. Uh, so th th really, I would say that, that that is what we need to look at, right? Is that we can be 100% right, we can be 100% uh, zealous, but we have to have the balance of the virtues. Uh, we have to have that kindness, that charity, that meekness, uh, and so on. And, and likewise, if, if I'm already kind, meek, and charitable, do I have zeal? And do I have boldness? And do I have firmness? It is very easy to hide cowardice as uh, a prudence, or it's very easy to hide uh, weakness as humility. You can hide it that way, right? Don't do that. Ask yourself, could you stand up if you had to? Can you have that difficult conversation? Can you hold somebody else accountable? That's what we need to be asking ourselves uh, from, from both sides. Uh, so um, let us thank St. Cyril, right, for holding up the doctrine of the, of the Blessed Mother, the Theotokos, the Mother of God, and ask her to instill us with the virtues that we need to supply for our defects. Maybe we have strong virtues. Okay, that's great. What are my faults and how can I fill them up? That's what we need to be asking ourselves. St. Cyril of Alexandria, uh, uh, St. Apollonia, pray for us. God bless you all, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.